Hype House, for as little as $1 a month, you can support the best Miami Vice podcast on the internet. We promise we won't use the money to find a freezer tube in the Atlantic or fund bowl semen transactions. To see all the benefits of supporting us directly, including early show access or even a free mustache, head on over to patreon.com slash go with the heat. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 5, Episode 5, titled Boroska. It's a little on the nose. Like, a little derivative on the name, actually. Like, you know, our main person is Boroska. <laughs> yeah. We're going to name it after Boroska. No creativity here. You can tell. It's Episode 5. <laughs> They're already mailing it in. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Writings on the wall. <laughs> it originally premiered on December 9th, 1988. John, this is where your revenge comes against me. The writer is Vladislavo Stepakudza. You son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. You want to try that one more time? <laughs> Let me give you both the names. You tell me which one is a pseudonym. We have Vladislavo Stepakudza. Kutza or Elvis Cole? <laughs> Elvis Cole sounds definitely like a pseudonym. <laughs> Not Vladimeska Stelioma. <laughs> well, you'd be right, because Elvis Cole is actually known as Robert Crace. Robert Crace wrote the episode Payback way back in season two. But for some reason, he wanted to put a pseudonym on this episode. <laughs> it's funny to say he wanted to put a pseudonym on it, but Vern Gillum, the director, did not. He also directed Child's Play and The Cows of October. He should have put a pseudonym on that one. <laughs> so so th this might be the highlight of his uh, con contributions. He still got two more episodes coming, by the way. Mm. So that's the thing. The Revenge <laughs> of Bull Seaman. All right, John. We've talked about big name artists before that have appeared in Vice episodes. And we talked about their cost coming down on how much money they can spend on music. But one of these bands is not like any of the others that has ever been in an episode of Vice and probably costs a lot of money. Yeah, so we have two pretty big names in music. And I'm going to start with I Want Your Hands on Me by Sinead O'Connor. Uh, because I feel like I have a, a little less to talk about with her than the other one. Sinead O'Connor, being an Irish singer-songwriter who rose to fame in the late 80s, her debut album, The Lion and the Cobra, in 1987, that debut album would go gold and get a Grammy nom. As a teen, got into trouble quite a bit. Later on, she would talk about in interviews how her parents were abusive, and that's one of the reasons why she's such a an advocate against like child abuse and stuff like that. Her teen years, when she was getting into trouble, she actually spent 18 months in an asylum slash, you know, like one of those asylums that are run by nuns. After getting out of there, in 1984, she would meet Calm Ferrelli and form the band Ton Ton Makuti. Makuti. <laughs> Soon after, she would drop out of school and start playing music full time, and it would get her noticed by Ensign Records, and they would give her a manager who was the former head of YouTube's Mother Records, Fachintna O'Sele. <laughs> Damn you Irish people and your goofy ass names. <laughs> like I am sure that that name is like Fa Shela or or Che or, or, or Shalele, but who knows? <laughs> Did you just say Shalele? <laughs> Yes, her manager, Shalele, who was the head of YouTube's Mother Records. He was very outspoken politically, and they said that he rubbed off on Sinead, which we will talk about momentarily. She had quite a bit of help. So other than that, she also was working with YouTube guitarist The Edge, and they co-wrote the song Heroin, which was used for the soundtrack for the film Captive. The Edge also helped work with her on their debut album, The Lion and the Cobra. That debut album would be a sensation. It would, it would be massive. And then she would follow that up with, I do not want what I haven't got, NME would rate the second best album of the year and would also give us her cover of the Prince song, Nothing Compares to You. Which is crazy that that was a Prince and song. <laughs> and, and it's around this time uh, when she would don her trademark shaved head. So she was really coming in her own in the 90s. She was even asked to join uh, a bunch of other guests for the Roger Waters 
Pink Floyd massive performance of The Wall in Berlin in 1990. We'll cross over there with the next band we're going to talk about. From there, she would do a ton of compilations with other artists. She would release some singles, do some sound check work, and ultimately she would continually release albums. I mean, all the way until now. Her albums have been somewhat successful, not quite as successful as as her peak. In the uh, 2000s, she started experimenting with different styles, which included a 2005 reggae album called Throw Down Your Arms. (laughs) Well, that is different. (laughs) She even has a new album in 2000, supposed to come out in 2019. Now, that new album is going to come out under her new name because in... 2017, she legally changed her name to Magda DeVitt. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So, in total, she's released 10 solo albums. Talking about Sinead O'Connor, as much as the music that you have to talk about are the controversies. So, in 1990, she announced she would not perform if the United States anthem was played before her concert, in which Frank Sinatra would go. Uh, would go on record saying that he would kick her in the ass. <laughs> so, which, by the way, I don't know if I've ever been to a concert in which they played the national anthem before it. I'm assuming, except for Springsteen concerts, that that's not a, a, a typical thing. <laughs> Especially, you know, with, with artists from the UK. But whatever. So, in 92, she would make a Saturday Night Live appearance, and she would perform the song, Bob Marley's Song, War. It would be an a cappella version that none of the producers were aware of that she was going to be doing. And in the middle of the performance, she would pull out a photo of Pope John Paul II while singing the verse Evil, and then tear it up into little pieces and throw it at the camera. That would spark quite the controversy. Immediately, it would be met without applause or booing, but just utter silence in the studio. (laughs) The rage would lead to 4,400 total calls of complaints. And the SNL host that night was Joe Pesci. He would remark later that if it was his show, he would get he would give her a smack. He would give her <laughs> such a smack. So here we got Frank Sinatra and Joe Pesci both threatening violence towards Sinead O'Connor. So uh, Joe Pesci got to smack her on the mouth. The threats would not just come from them. So Madonna would her next SNL appearance. She would then mock her by tearing up a photo of Joey Buttafuoco. <laughs> follow that up with a number of criticisms about Sinead that involved how wonderful Madonna is. Yeah, that well, sounds I mean, about right. Yeah, that's yeah, what Madonna yeah. does. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it has nothing to yeah, do with, like, yeah. I have an opinion here. It's more like, I'm going to capitalize on this. We go from there to 1995, in which she called in and then randomly showed up at a recording of a TV show called After Dark. Uh, I guess the talk show was doing a panel in which they were having a discussion about child abuse and how at the time with Catholics, how it was an epidemic there. And so and she decided to randomly show up on set and give her two cents. And then in 2013, she also published an open letter to Miley Cyrus about the treatment of women in the music industry. Outside of that, she dealt with some health issues. She's talked about in interviews how she has dealt with bipolar issues. Briefly, during the 2000s, dealt with a bout of fibromyalgia as well. Obviously, if you want to know more about her political and religious beliefs, just Google her. Uh, she talks about that crap all the time. <laughs> the next song in our music and final song is The Dogs of War by Pink Floyd, who obviously is an English rock band formed in 1965 and one of the most commercially successful and influential groups in pop music history. Pink Floyd was founded by Sid Barrett, who was at the time the lead singer and guitarist, and was made up of Nick Mason on drums, Roger Waters on bass and vocals, and Richard Wright on keyboards and vocals, and would later include David Gilmore, who would take over on guitar and, you guessed it, vocals. Because everybody's got to (laughs) sing. Except Nick Mason. He knows his place. (laughs) You know, what's a weird twist with Pink Floyd? I know this this is going to sound weird, but they are an underappreciated band. Even though they are a gigantic success and everyone knows Pink Floyd music and everyone is aware of The Wall and Dark Side of the Moon, they are underappreciated for what they are. They are a life changing generation changing band that with Sid Barrett and David Gilmore takes over as full-time lead singer here they continue to change themselves so many times 
and really change how music is created. In my opinion, like on the level of the Beatles for changing how a whole generation looks at music. I don't think a lot of people realize, a lot of people know the Pink Floyd, like you said, The Wall, Dark Side of the Moon, and like Wish You Were Here. Like they know that music of them. I think people would be surprised if they went out and checked out like The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, which was their first album. Even their last album, Final Cut, because they had a lot more albums than what most people know. And they were, their sound was completely different on those albums too. Most of their original Sid Barrett stuff was very folky, whereas Mm -hmm. Water's stuff was more psychedelic rock. And then they even got into the, when you got into the 80s and Gilmore kind of took over with things, they went total 80s progressive rock. So, but let's just jump into this real quick. Waters and Mason met while studying architecture in London. (laughs) They would join a band and it would eventually include Wright. So the original band would be Roger Waters, Nick Mason, and uh, Richard Wright. And that iteration of the band would be called Sigma Six. And they would go through several name changes. All right. And, and you know, you guys know me. I love the pre band name, pre uh, <laughs> names, right? <laughs> Believe it or not, one of the names after Sigma Six was Mega Deaths, plural. <laughs> Mega Deaths, plural. Nice. They could have been the original Mega Death. Saying. <laughs> They were also the Abdabs and the Screaming Abdabs. <laughs> then they were the Leonard's Loggers and the Spectrum Five before finally se- settling on the name the T Set. <laughs> the band would change some of the lineups, and that is when Barrett would join in. Actually, they would first refer to themselves as the Pink Floyd Sound when another band named the T named T Set would show up for the same gig in 1965. So what happened was, is that they both showed up for the same gig. They were both called the T-Set. Obviously, you can't have the band the T-Set come on after the band the (laughs) T-Set. Barrett quickly came up with the band name, which he just took two names of blues artists that he had in, in his record collection, being Pink Anderson and Floyd Council, making up the Pink Floyd sound. By 1966, they would have, they dropped the sound part and they started picking up the more psychedelic sound. Also got started to get more of the long instrumentals. This is when they started playing the London Underground. But by 67, Sid Barrett began to unravel. And this is also when he started using LSD. And it would not take very long for him to, for, for him to start to go downhill. He would show up at shows and interviews, be largely despondent. Uh, just kind of staring off at stuff. They were trying bringing in David Gilmore, friend and former classmate of Sid's, to play guitar. And at first, David Gilmore was just brought in to play Sid's guitar parts to just lip sync Sid's vocals. But it became quickly apparent that Sid was not gonna not gonna be able to contribute much as the band went on after Gilmore joined in December '68, or I'm sorry, in December '67. By April 68, Barrett would end up being out of the band, and that would force Roger Waters into taking over, basically, as the primary writer. 1968 album, Saucer of Secrets, featured Barrett's final contributions, as well as Waters' first songs, first songs that he actually wrote. They would follow that up with 1970s album, Adam Heart Mother, which is actually their first number one album. Ultimately, under Barrett, they would have uh, they only released two charting singles and one album, "The Piper at the Gates of Dawn" in '67. Now that Barrett was gone and Gilmore was in the band, Waters really uh, took over uh, to the point where she started pushing. It started to really kind of piss off the members of the band. We roll out with "Dark Side of the Moon," which would ultimately their be-, be their best-selling album, third best-selling album of all time first number one album in the u.s would remain on the billboard charts for 14 years it is insane how that album performed and continues to perform and every generation it's like it gets discovered for the first time again and and, i mean they would just knock it out of the park with the the next follow-ups they would follow that up with wish you were here in 75 animals and 
77, and then the wall in 79, and then finally Final Cut in 83 as this iteration of Pink Floyd. Wish You Were Here is basically written by Waters as a biography of the rise and fall of Sid Barrett. Animals written about the George Orwell novel Animal Farm, and then The Wall is basically about Waters' childhood. So this is where I was going to jump in and talk about how much of a Pink Floyd nerd and fan that I am. And it really has to do with these three albums is Dark Side of the Moon, Animals, and The Wall. So for me, my favorite album from Pink Floyd is Animals. But with Wish You Were Here, I would argue to say that that is the greatest love album that has ever been made. Now, Roger Waters will say that Wish You Were Here, the song, is about his marriage and then divorce. But Shine On You Crazy Diamond is probably the greatest love song that's ever been written because it is about Sid Barrett and them missing that he is not part mm-hmm. of that band. And he's still alive. He's just not there with them. They can't handle him anymore. And that guilt like that they're carrying, that they can't handle one of their friends anymore. I would argue to say that's one of the best love songs that have ever been made. Two is I would say that Time from Dark Side of the Moon is my favorite song from Pink Floyd. And it's really because of the lyrics. Now, it, the, the guitar is great. It hit, it hit it out of the park with that song. But there's these lyrics that go over and over in my head. And I have them here. We're going to read them real fast. So you run and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking. Racing around to come up behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older, shorter of breath, one day closer to death. That section, a quote from that song, goes through my head a hundred times a week. You're right. Just the symbolism and, and everything just lyrically with that is just fantastic. And I'm with you. I would say... Shine on you, crazy diamonds. Probably my favorite of theirs is that that probably gets the most a weekly from me because I just love that song and that song has got such a nice it's got such a nice long instrumental through it too that I I can just kind of lose myself in it for a good ten minutes. Reading the biographies and stuff, most of that is Roger Waters. That that's him writing. Now the band always contributed. But during the making of these albums, as they went album to album, bickering of the band was constantly that Roger, Roger Waters didn't feel like they were con- the other members of the band were contributing enough as far as writing songs and <laughs> stuff like that. The other members of the band were upset because they were being paid per song and Roger Waters was making more money than the rest of the band because he was writing all the songs. <laughs> and... They accused him of pretty much not letting them contribute, basically by saying like they could kicking their songs off the album for his back and forth. Ultimately, it would lead to 1982's final cut, which would basically be like a Roger Waters solo album. And it would ultimately be what pushed the band over the edge. Now, in 79, they had already booted out uh, Richard Wright because of his, they believed his, his divorce was getting in the way and he wasn't contributing anymore. And then after 82, Waters decided, hey, you know, I'm doing all the work here. I'm going to go out on my own. So Waters released his first solo album, Pros and Cons of, the, of Hitchhiking, in 85. And at the same time, Waters also tries to go through every way possible to legally prevent Gilmore and the rest of the band members from continuing with Pink Floyd. So lawsuits to prevent them to use the name, including a lawsuit to try and dissolve the band, which would eventually lead to Gilmore winning the lawsuits and still holding on to permission. So, and I like what Gilmore did too. They ended up working and bringing Richard Wright back into the band so they had mm. more founding members in the band. <laughs> then that way they were like, no, 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 no. See, we've got founding members too, so we can go play Pink Floyd music as well. From 85 on, Waters started doing his solo stuff, and David Gilmore took over writing the music, which they would end up releasing two more albums, and those albums would be A Momentary Lapse of Reason in 87 and The Division Bell in 94. And there's just bickering over the years between Roger Waters and David Gilmore. There was never really a reunion until 2005. They reunited for a Live 8 show in London. First time since, you know, 
know, since the early 80s that Waters and the entire band played together. In 2006, Sid Barrett will, passed away. And then in 2008, Richard Wright would pass away. And that would lead to Mason and Gilmore putting together their final album, The Endless River, in 2014, ultimately without Waters. They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 96, and as of 2013, have sold over 250 million records, which is insane. Because I can't go on and on and on and on about this, I am cutting a lot of little details out that I normally like to focus on. I will say that Pink Floyd is definitely a band worth learning about, even if you just want to learn about the individuals. Now, I have read a little bit of Sid Barrett's stuff. He's a very interesting guy to read about. There's controversy as far as what was actually wrong with Sid Barrett. A lot of people have said that he was schizophrenic, mm. but other people said that his mental deterioration was caused by an overdose of LSD. And then there've it's been talked about in interviews, like there was an interview with uh, David Gilmore where he talked about where he felt that Barrett was schizophrenic and that that overdose of LSD was just a catalyst. I definitely recommend oh, there's some good biographies out there. Well, I guess you could say the song is over. I thought I had more to say. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much stuff about Pink Floyd and there there isn't enough time to talk about them, especially because the band kept, even without Raj Waters, kept releasing music into the 90s. Their career as a yeah. band spanned 30 plus years. I mean, it's one of the things that I wish I could get a chance to see is the performance of The Wall, but not enough time to talk about it right now. I will be happy to talk more about Pink Floyd any other time. Just maybe not on the record. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode because I've been sitting on some controversial thoughts here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. There's some controversial opinions here at the end, and we <laughs> would love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash goalwiththeheat. Twitter, at Go With The Heat. Instagram, at Go With The Heat. You know how to get a hold of us. Where do you stand on this with Castillo? Me and John were kind of hard on Dad this week about his decision to take this. A little bit more personal than we and anticipated. And also wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to check out that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to support us. Support step number one. Send us that email, GoWithTheHeat.com. Step two, go review the show on iTunes. And step three, check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.